Welcome, welcome everybody uh, to this webinar on photonic medical devices for treatment and uh, regenerative medicine. So I already shared my screen. Let me go to my slide. So the program for the next uh, hour and a half, I will uh, present to you briefly um, the project Atlantic Catbed and uh, the structure Okay, I'm sorry for this uh, technical problem. Apparently I was disconnected. So I don't know if uh, you heard me uh, start on my slide or not. You can restart from the, the beginning, I guess. Okay. All right, sorry about that, let me share my screen again. All right, so do you see do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, as I was saying, the program of the day, uh, I will talk to you briefly about the project uh, Atlantic Ketmed and, uh, and then present to you uh, the structure of Anov that I represent today and, uh, and let the floor then to our two experts uh, that uh, will um, speak about the topic of the day. So our project uh, Atlantic Ketmed is an interreg uh, European project. Its aim is to establish a transnational advanced pilot manufacturing ecosystem for future biomedical products. So let's see a little bit the consortium. Uh, as you can see on the right of this slide here, we represent uh, different regions of Europe, all in the Atlantic uh, coast. Uh, from Portugal to, to Ireland. So we have first uh, INL, which is uh, Portuguese partners specialist in uh, nanotechnology. We have BioNow from UK that is specialist uh, of the biomedical and life science sector. Uh, the University of Galway, which is 
uh, the lead partner of, of this project. Then we have FIDIS, uh, which is based uh, in, in Spain, uh, which is a tra technology transfer center in the healthcare environment. Then uh, also from the UK, we have STFC that works with uh, 3D metals and polymer additive, and uh, also training uh, additive uh, manufacturing. And uh, we also have Atlampol Biotherapy, which is a French uh, partner based in, in Nantes, in the west of France, that is a specialist of business incubation and international development of, of, uh, of uh, companies in the health sector as well. So let's have an overview of uh, the project. Uh, you can see here the five steps uh, that we use uh, all along this project to develop uh, SMEs, European SMEs. Uh, the aim is to uh, exploit the leverage factor of the key enabling technologies and create a uh, new product concept uh, in medical uh, environment. So the first step was a stakeholder mapping on transnational value chain. We then proceed in innovation audits for SMEs. Uh, all of the partners work with SMEs from their region of Europe. We then proceeded to a value chain analysis. Then we use uh, different tools that you see here in green to, to get to, uh, I would say the final step of, uh, of the process, which is transnational uh, case study. I will develop that uh, just, uh, just after. So the innovation audits uh, that we did was an assessment of innovation in, in SMEs benchmarking across seven categories that you can see here uh, on the slide, uh, which lead to uh, meetings that we had, each partner had with, uh, with the companies of their, of their region. The next step, as I said, is the analysis of their value chain. So we studied with them their products, their innovation, their processes, um, in order to uh, study their environment uh, and the main actors that, um, that uh, work on their field of expertise that are reaching the same markets. Uh, the goal was to uh, determine uh, potential partners, potential uh, competitors in, in their market. So this value chain analysis um, is uh, based on four steps. Four steps. Uh, first is defining the product concept, identifying uh, stakeholders. And then we had a system of uh, scoring uh, the stakeholders to determine uh, which uh, actors were uh, the most important uh, for, for, uh, for the SMEs in their market, in their uh, technology. And um, the goal of this step was to create a scalable system model that the SMEs uh, could then use when trying to develop new products or enter new markets, for example. Then the, the final step uh, of uh, this, um, this project was to allow SMEs to access what we call key enabling uh, technology procedure. So basically, um, all, of, uh, all of us, the seven partners, we have um, infrastructures, we have labs, um, human resources, uh, expertise that, uh, that we have uh, at our disposals and uh, the goal of this step was to work with the SMEs to, to give them access to that, to help them develop new products and see if, for example, their prototypes are, are good or not. So that was um, briefly the, the aim of the whole project. Um, I will talk a little bit about Alphanov. Uh, so we are a technology center in optics and lasers. Uh, here are some facts and, and numbers. Um, 
I will not develop too much on, on this, but we are running uh, collaborative projects. We're working on patents and uh, we support uh, startups, for example. Uh, we are located in mostly in Bordeaux, uh, but we also have an office in Limoges that is located. Uh, well, you can you can see it on the on the map here, and we work with uh, different partners. Uh, you can see their their logo on the on the slide. So our missions, the, the most important missions, are first uh, support job creation in our field, which is, as I said, photonics, uh, laser, optics, uh, support technology transfer, and strengthen uh, the leadership in photonics of our region, which is uh, Nouvelle-Aquitaine. Uh, so here is some example of uh, creation of startups, spin-offs uh, across the photonics value chain. So. Uh, with different areas, components, laser sources, system integrators, and uh, processes. Uh, you can see below um, uh, the new startups and companies created uh, after collaborating with, uh, with Alphanov. So we are organized in four business units, laser sources and components, photonic systems, laser processing, and also training uh, through our um, training center, which is called PILA. And we're addressing uh, different markets. Um, of course, the one that uh, is related to AKM is uh, biotechnology, uh, pharmaceutical and health. But we also uh, address uh, aeronautics, defense, uh, space and security, industry 4.0, and uh, every other opportunity markets that is related um, to laser or photonics. So let's now talk about what uh, interests us today. Uh, we have uh, two experts uh, here, uh, Dr. Serge Mordon, which will talk to you about uh, laser scar healing technique, uh, which is called LASH, uh, from fun fundamental research to uh, commercialization and you read uh, on the description of the event that uh, Rafael de Villar was uh, supposed to to talk about animal bioimpression uh, he was not able to be there today uh, he apologizes for that but he sent us uh, the best uh, PhD student of uh, Biotis laboratory which is Nicolas Tuya that knows very well this subject and, uh, and we'll talk about it in a moment. Um, I uh, encourage you to ask uh, your questions to, to Serge and Nicolas through the chat section that you can see on the right of your screen. Uh, you cannot talk uh, directly through this platform, but uh, you can write down your question and uh, after each intervention, I will read them for Serge and Nicolas to, to answer them. So that's that's uh, enough for me. I will uh, stop sharing my screen. And uh, Serge, I, I let you the, the floor. Thank you, Anis. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. So once again, thank you for the invitation. So today I'm going to speak about a, a technique uh, we developed uh, for plastic surgeon to improve scars uh, using uh, laser. So in introduction, uh, and we have a figure for the US, more than 70 million surgical procedures are performed annually in the USA with a majority involving a skin lesion and almost all individuals uh, in their lifetime will have one of more surgical procedures resulting in scars. And patients and physicians are motivated to improve a cosmetic outcome of scars. There was a, a paper published in uh, PRS, Plastic Reconstructive Surgery, which is the best journal in, the, in this field, 
uh, demonstrated that 60% of patients are discontent of their scar outcome. 87% would be interested in any technique that could prevent or improve a scar. And 92% of patients would like a less visible scar. So it's a concern and, you know, the, for each, when you start a project, the first thing is really to understand the basic mechanism. And as I spend and my group, we spend some time to, to have a better understanding. Uh, there are many teams involved uh, in, the, in, in this research, in research about the wound healing process. And it would take a long, you know, many hours to explain in details. But let's, let's say that, uh, you know, the wounding process has evolved to rapidly repair injuries. It was a kind of adaptation of humans. Uh, and the price we have to pay for the repair, uh, fast repair, is in fact uh, an healing with scars. We could and we learn from basic research and uh, that, in fact, this scar formation is driven by some specific fibroblasts. We have specific cells in the skin which uh, produce uh, new skin, collagen, uh, fibers, and so on. And we know also that it's a very complex uh, mechanism where different uh, molecules that we call growth factors are involved. And we know that if we have, for example, uh, more TGF beta-3 transformer, transforming growth factor beta-3 compared to TGF beta-1, uh, it will result in uh, less car and a better healing. The same, the same thing is involved about collagen, but again, it's a very, it's a domain for experts and we will no, uh, we'll not go further in that, in, in, in that direction. One thing you have to understand is that fetal skin possesses the ability to regenerate completely. And we learned that from surgery performed in utero. That means humans have the possibility to scar without, uh, to, to heal without scars. But we lost this uh, capability due to kind of adaptation. Uh, however, uh, there are several groups now who understood, and our group understood that in order to induce a scarless healing, the wound environment should be modified as early as possible in order to change the hemostasis process and the matrix turnover. That means we, uh, there are at least four mechanisms. The first one is hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation, maturation. Here you have days. But if you change by specific technique, the environment of cells, if you change the, the production of some specific molecule, you have the possibility to, in fact, change the healing process and maybe the opportunity to obtain a pure regeneration without any scars. And the concept we developed, in fact, is in fact based on years of work and the idea is to generate it I would call that a local fever in order to modify the hemostasis and information, information phase. I will not go in detail because it's a very complex issue, but just to uh, very briefly, a temperature increase, if we are able to perform a local temperature increase uh, on, the, uh, on the injury, uh, it, it would be possible to change, in fact, the process and here I mentioned HSP70. HSP70 is a kind of flag who demonstrated that we were able to modify, in fact, the, the response. I will mention that later on. Okay, we have other explanation. It's a, we, it's a very complex thing. I think uh, we, under, we understood only a part of the mechanism, but at least we understood enough to be able to design a new approach and to uh, be able to succeed in reducing at least the scarring and sometimes to uh, uh, avoid any scarring uh, of patients. So we also, in order to do that, the, the basic understanding, the, the understanding of a mechanism is one, is one issue, but uh, uh, we were also concerned to develop a specific system 
that can be used every day by plastic surgeons. So we, we have to consider uh, also the, the way and the, uh, the, the plastic surgeon uh, work in an operating room. And it also, in order to develop uh, a technique, we develop a specific approach which uh, was patented. So we've, uh, we did that with two of my students. One, Axel Capo is a plastic surgeon. He did his PhD with me. And uh, Chris Lansumon, now who is the head of a big uh, the research center of a big company, was a biophysicist working with me on that project at that time. It was almost, uh, almost 20 years ago. So the concept we developed was to use a laser to generate heat and a transparent dressing to induce approximation of the edges of the incision. That's very important if you want a good healing. You need, if you cut the tissue, you, you, uh, you need really about the, the wound, you need to have, uh, to have a good uh, contact between the edges in order to, to have a good healing too. So during all these years, we, we did a lot of studies. We published a lot of papers. I'm going to share with you some papers, only a few, but you are interested. You can find more details about uh, my talk in this uh, paper published in peer review journal. The first one of the first things we did is to, in fact, to prove that our concept was feasible on animals and we use a specific animals, uh, that, which is a, a airless rat. This air has, well, has no air, <laughs> its name is its name, it's, uh, due to that, and uh, is able to mimic the skin of the face of a human. It's uh, almost the same uh, thickness. So it was an interesting uh, um, um, animals to, to study the, the, the healing. We perform, and when I say we, in fact, the plastic surgeon, they perform dorsal skin incision down to the muscle four centimeters in length, we, per we perform four in order to, to be able to have on the same animal the control and different possibility and the, uh, each animal was its own control. And we measure a lot of parameters. First, we perform some clinical evaluation, histopathologic study. Uh, so we look and I don't know if you are really expert in that field, but we are able to cut the tissue and to see what's going on and more precise also identification of that we call HSP-70 with specific molecule, molecules, collagen type one, type three. It's really a domain of, you, you must be expert to really have a good understanding, but uh, all, if you are involved in this research, it's important to be able to demonstrate that we act and we have an effect on these specific uh, molecules. So, Again, I have no time to go in detail, but we, we have a protocol where we are able to apply the laser and we apply the, con the conventional technique. The con conventional technique is to insert a suture, some wire, inside the skin to obtain the approximation. And the other one was, in fact, similar to the laser that we use a transparent adhesive dressing to obtain the contact of the edges uh, on the incision, but without the laser. So first, the, some the, the clinical results. Uh, this picture were taken the same animals uh, four days after the incision the surgery. So here you can see the, the incision is closed. You can see it's still red. We have inflammation, and we have the suture inside. It's a, that usually inside the skin. The suture was, was inserted that way, and you can see on each uh, each extremity of the, the, the incision, four centimeters, the, the suture. This suture usually is removed after a few days, or we have also what we call reservable suture that disappears by itself. That's the results without the suture, with, just with the uh, transparent dressing. You can see there is a scar. But there is less inflammation, and that's a problem with suture, that the fact you have a foreign body inside the skin, you increase the inflammation, you delay the healing. So on one, it's good to obtain, in fact, some strength, but you have to pay a price, and the price is, in fact, inflammation, and it's a delayed healing process. And that's the result with, in fact, the laser. And even if you can observe a very discreet, uh, uh, scars, you can see that the, the, there is a big difference and we have almost no scar. And again, it's day four. Uh, 
after a few days, it would be much better. So in order to have a better understanding, you cut the tissue, you perform histology, and you can see at day seven, it's almost, it's very difficult to see where we, we perform the incision. That's the epidermis, that's the, the skin, the dermis, that's the muscle. For the, uh, the uh, dressing alone, uh, the, the transparent dressing, the tape, you can see there is inflammation, that cells prove there is inflammation. And here is with the conventional ant antidermal suture. You can see the hole of a suture, and you can see here we, we still uh, it's not closed. We, we still do have strength. It's due to the eye inflammation. So you see the clinical results, okay, obviously, but you can see uh, on the histology there is a huge difference. If you look at in detail, you can see uh, there is a reorientation of the fibers. That means. The scars are, it, are mainly due to the disorganization of the fibers. That means the skin, the new skin produced during the scar is different from the normal skin. It's different because it's disorganized. If it's reorganized, you will, will have the same, the, the same aspect, so that means you will be unable to see a scar. And with no laser, it's disorganized. We perform also a tensiometric study because it was a concern. If you do not put the suture. Is, is there any uh, impact about the strength? Yes, there is a, uh, an impact. It, we have much more strength without the, the, the suture than uh, compared to, to, to the suture. And this is the strength of 10 at day 7 and day 15. Uh, you can understand that at day 15, the suture will be much more resistant than uh, at day 7 and at day 4. We perform also immunochemistry. We were interested by one, several specific molecules. One of them is uh, each protein. It was performed with expert uh, by Professor Prof. Barbara Pola, which is a worldwide reconnect expert in uh, HSP. Uh, and uh, she, she told us it was the first time she was able to see uh, um, um, so many HCSP inside the epidermis, the dermis. And this observation proved that we were uh, able to generate uh, it, and also we were able to modify the inflammation process. It was the same about the ratio between uh, type 1 and type 3. Uh, scarlet ceiling is associated to uh, type 1, type 3 ratio, uh, low ratio, and we, we compare the laser to the control. Can see is 0.5 uh, for the laser compared to uh, almost five. That means 10 times different about the different uh, the, uh, the control for the superficial dermis uh, and for uh, dermis in depth. The, the difference was uh, three times, which was really a lot when you are an expert in that field. Usually, you can appreciate this difference. So just to conclude this first step about the mechanism, I was very quick, but again, uh, time is running short and uh, it would take hours to give you details. The, the laser assisted skin healing, uh, the, the idea is to precisely control the heat stress during the inflammatory phase of the skin healing process in order to modify the repair mechanism and to reduce the residual scar and accelerate the wound closure. So after this, all this research, fundamentals and experimentals, uh, we founded a company in 2008. It was a startup, and we start to develop a specific laser for plastic surgeon because it was one of our concerns. The plastic surgeon, they told us, okay, we don't want a big system. We don't want to use fibers. We want a portable system. This laser, we, we should be able to put in our backpack to, to go from one clinic to, to another one. It should work without, the, it should be very simple. And after research, we were even able to develop a laser with only one switch on off. The system is able to determine the optimal parameter by itself. And uh, we, with the first company, we were able to design and to obtain the support to perform a randomized clinical study. It was performed at the Lille University Hospital in the north of France. It's a big hospital. And it was performed, the, the PI, the principal investigator, was, in fact, Alexandre Capon, my former PhD student, who is a, is a plastic surgeon as well. And in 2012, the, uh, the 
company called Urgo Laboratories, which uh, this company is a turnover now about uh, 600 million euros in France, take over, uh, took over the project and finalized the laser. In fact, uh, in 2008, we developed a laser with a diode laser, but at that time, it was only possible to use, to, to have 800 nanometers. We moved to 12, 1200 uh, in order to treat all uh, skin, what we call phototype. That means we have white people and black people. It's very, and the, the idea is to have a system to treat all population from the, you know, uh, uh, from Finland to uh, Africa. And uh, another clinical evaluation was performed, uh, randomized clinical study in Marseille by Professor Casanova. And these uh, two uh, clinical studies were performed. So just to give you, it, to, it took uh, some, some time, in fact, to develop this system, the prototypes, to go to a prototype to a final system. So the idea was to, to develop a system, portable system, battery powered, fully automated. The system with a battery is less than 600 grams. Uh, and one of the major issues was to be able to reproduce the parameters. Reproduce the parameters, that means the wavelength should be always the same, the power should be always the same, the duration should be always the same. And one main concern when it's used by clinicians is to be able to have always the same uh, beam. And in order to cover uh, sometimes a very long incision, this incision, if you perform abdominoplasty, the, the length could be 50, 60 centimeters. Uh, we developed, and thanks to the support of a German company, we were able to develop a system with a, a specific optic giving a, a, a beam of 20 millimeters by 4 millimeters and homogeneous beam. One also of the concept it's patented is in fact to use some uh, specific tape I mentioned the tape, but these steps are now much more uh, clever. They integrate uh, uh, a radio uh, frequency ident identification. That means we have parameters inside the laser parameters inside the tape, and uh, the tape is necessary in order to activate the laser. And as soon as the treatment is performed, the tape is deactivated. So this is, in fact, the, the, the final design of the system. Uh, the power of the laser is forward. It's uh, sufficient to, to, to get the temperature we need. We have even so, a pyrometer to control the temperature in order to avoid any overheating. Because the, really, one of the key success factors of that technique is to generate the, some heat, but this heat should be always the same. It should, should be perfectly controlled. So about the safety, um, the safety strips. So it now, now it's uh, developed and commercialized by uh, Urgo. It's uh, and it's patented, and uh, there is some technological innovation inside this tape and the screen of a laser. And uh, again, uh, it's, uh, this system enables uh, reproducibility of, uh, of a treatment. It ensures safety for the patient and so on. So just very briefly, uh, the strip that have uh, some movie after, the strip is uh, applied along the, the incision. The laser, the battery powered system is inserted inside the service shift because we are in the in operating room. The laser is enabled and the laser is ready to communicate with the strip and uh, thanks to uh, with uh, radio frequency identification and the treatment is performed. So these are the results of the first study uh, where we perform uh, evaluation on patient. So the patient was also uh, her, usually it was female patient uh, on control for breast surgery or abdominoplasty. You can see the difference between the control portion and the treated portion. Again, uh, these patients were treated by expert uh, plastic surgeons, for, so the, the scars are even on the control part very nice, but you can see on the treated portion, it's difficult to see the, the, the scar. Uh, even if some is, are still remaining, we perform profilometry, we use specific system, and you can see, and each time, in fact, the, the, the scar treated with the laser was much smaller 
was reduced, the IF was reduced by 40%. So all this study was uh, were performed, are published, and all patients were improved. So there are some other examples of the control portion and the treated portion. Each time we have an uh, improvement, sometimes it will have also more the direct appearance of the scar. The second uh, clinical evaluation was performed in Marseille by Professor Casanova and his group. Uh, it was performed 40 patients. The follow-up peri period was 12 months. Even if when you have a scars, to obtain the final scars, it will take at least 18 months and sometimes two years. Maybe I'm quite sure all of you, you have a scar somewhere. So I don't go into detail about the demographic data. Uh, I'm going to show you the final results. The, again, the, the volume of a twisted scar was improved by 30%, uh, and it was highly significant. And you can see the difference between uh, the non-treated uh, breast and the treated breast. Again, it's a high magnification uh, picture. So uh, um, here it's uh, less than uh, one millimeter, one millimeter and half. Again, the scar volume was measured and uh, reduction 20%, the scar surface, the scar roughness, each time it was highly significant for each patient, the 40 patient, uh, an improvement was observed. Again, so, uh, some other parameters uh, specific to plastic surgeon, uh, what, uh, what we call the modify OSAS score, which is used by plastic surgeon each time we have a highly significant modification. And even the patient, they, they prefer, in fact, that technique. And um, they, they prefer at, at one year, you know, all of them, they, they, they said that they prefer the, 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 the breast uh, and the zone treated with the laser. Again, some picture uh, non-treated treated zone at 12 months follow-up, even if it will be improved a little bit uh, later on. Uh, okay, uh, one of example, you can see each time we have an improvement of the, the, the patient. Uh, non-treated, untreated. So now, uh, this system is commercialized uh, by Urgo uh, Laboratories only in France and in, in Spain. They started in Spain uh, uh, one year ago. You can see uh, that the plastic surgeon now, and uh, at least in Paris, uh, many of them, they, they, they use the laser. And now, they, uh, even the patient, they are aware that if they they have plastic surgery for breast reduction, for abdominoplasty. There is a technique to, to reduce the scars. So in conclusion of my talk, and um, I would say that since the beginning of this project, uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary expertise was required. And uh, uh, scientists, basic scientists, plastic surgeon, uh, anatomopathologists, engineers, and so on. And in order to, to go from the basic science to the final product and to, to, to the uh, with the product used by the plastic surgeon, uh, many people were involved. And it was, to me, very interesting to be the, the coordinator of such a project. This project helped us also, and uh, even helped me to acquire knowledge through collaboration with research laboratory and industrial companies. For example, uh, we decided to, to have a battery-powered system almost 15 years ago. Battery was not so popular, and we were not so sure that it could be possible to uh, power a laser for uh, at least one uh, uh, for many minutes. Usually, the, the, the laser treatment, it takes six minutes to 10 minutes. OK, but for, to be safe, uh, the, the, the challenge was to have a system uh, being able to uh, work for at least 30 minutes. So we work with uh, companies like uh, in France, SAFT, in order to really to have a good understanding of the technology. And I mentioned also the technology, the specific technology to have a very nice uh, laser beam and so on. The ability to perform clinical studies when one success key factor, because again, many projects, they stop because they are far from the, the, real, uh, the real world. 
since the early beginning, plastic surgeons were involved. We, did, we have the experience, and that's part of my knowledge, uh, to be able to design clinical study, to go through all the all this regulation, you know, the European Medical Agency, the French Medical Agency, the Ethical Committee, the CMARC, and so on. Now it's, more, it's really complex and you need expertise. You need also to identify people to help you to, to, to find all these uh, papers. The design of a medical device specifically for plastic surgeon was another success key factor. And uh, again, uh, a laser for, for the experimental work we use a conventional laser with a fiber but uh, no no plastic surgeon wanted to use such a system it was too complex too heavy uh, it you know, it was not for them you know and if we you want to develop a system with a laser now uh, for physician, okay, uh, it must be uh, physician friendly, it must be plastic surgeon friendly. It, you don't need to be an expert, an engineer in laser to use uh, this laser. And again, we are pleased now that this system is now commercialized by, uh, by Urgo and uh, Urgo Touch. So if I have uh, two or three more minutes, that's, uh, you can find this video on the Urgo Touch website just to summarize what, what I said about uh, uh, what's the real life, you know what? It's just after the end of a plastic surgery. And uh, just to show you how the plastic surgeon and his team use the laser to, to, to reduce the scarring process and sometimes to, to avoid the scars. So that's the, the safety strip. So there are steroids, there are... Uh, so uh, RFID are inside. Uh, in fact, when you treat the forehead, for example, the head, or you treat the back, the skin is not has not the same thickness. So the surgeon will select the, the, the proper strip in order to treat the specific zone. That means each strip has the specific parameter for a specific zone. Uh, but the, 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 the plastic surgeon doesn't need really to know the parameter because they are inside the, the system. And the, the treatment the, will be uh, automatic. That means you just press on the switch and the, the switch, the, 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 the treatment will stop when the, the treatment will be performed. That means it doesn't need to stop. The, the system is automatic. So when he has applied the, the strip along the, the incision, he removed this, in fact, uh, uh, this part, and he has to apply the laser in contact uh, with the safety strip where there is an exchange of data. And uh, for example, uh, here, uh, that the, the parameters. So, uh, and when it's treated, it stops automatically and is able to move to another zone. It will be unable to treat, to go back because the, the, the strip is, dis, is deactivated. So that was the main idea. But it took uh, some time uh, to, to develop such a system, which is now commercialized. So I stop here. And I thank, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Serge, for uh, this uh, very interesting talk. Um, I don't see any questions on the chat. Uh, please do not uh, do not hesitate uh, if you have uh, any comments or, or questions. Uh, I see that Ian is, is typing something. I'm able to read. I saw. I saw that Ian is, is typing. Okay. I'm able to read the, the question. Perfect. Uh, is there any application for this technology to conic wounds? Uh, good question. Uh, it's again. Uh, it's the healing. The uh, acute healing, you know, when you perform an incision chronic, uh, chronic wound, it's, it's really different. We, we did some work on that. Uh, I think we should go further. Maybe uh, such an approach, not exactly the same, but at least uh, the fact 
that we are able to change the, uh, the, the inflammation process and the healing process could, could play a role for chronic wounds. At the moment, uh, I, cannot, I cannot answer uh, it's possible. Uh, but okay, it could, we could uh, study further in that direction. Yes, it's just a single treatment. So like the, uh, the question is, for surgical wounds, is it just a single treatment? Yes, it's performed inside the operative room. As soon as uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the incision, I don't know if you are familiar with plastic surg uh, surgery, but uh, in depth, the, um, uh, the plastic surgeon put some suture, uh, usually two to three centimeters apart, so it's in the very deep dermis, and usually put another suture in the upper dermis, what I showed on what. In that case, we don't use this superficial suture, but it's, it's, um, it's performed uh, immediately uh, after the, the, uh, the, the closing of the, the and it's uh, only one session. Because we, we need to act immediately after uh, when the, the, the incision is performed. It will not work uh, after two or three days. It will be too late. We will not be able to change the, the uh, you know, the environment of the, of the incision at uh, a few minutes after the incision, two hours after the incision, or two days after the, and the incision is absolutely different. And we need to act as early as possible. What kind of follow-up control is required recommended after treatment? There is, no, I mean, similar to conventional surgery. So the, the patient will go to, to the plastic surgeon to, 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 to have, uh, that's it. There is no specific, uh, there is no now a specific follow-up uh, due to that treatment. Now this treatment is approved. It's approved in, in, in Europe. Soon it should be approved in the US. So Urgo is working to, uh, to obtain the, the FDA approval. No more question? So there is no more question. I thank you very much. And uh, I think now it's Nicolas. Thank you. Yes, Nicolas, if, uh, if you can... Uh share your screen yes hello everybody um, okay so can everyone see the presentation yes we can we can see it perfect so before starting, I would like to say thank you for the invitation and giving us the opportunity to share our lab uh, work. So today, uh, my name is Nicolas Tuya. I'm a second year PhD student in the Biotis unit based in Bordeaux under the supervision Nicolas, of- Nicolas, it's, oui? it's not in full screen. You need to ah. activate full, uh, we, have, we see the, the presentation, but yeah. Okay. So. Uh, mm, mm, mm. Just. I think you, you, it was possible I, I, to. Mm, I will just screen uh, share the the whole screen. So is it better now? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Serge. <laughs> uh, so let me start again from the beginning. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, I am Nicolas Tuya, second year PhD student in Biotis Lab under the supervision of Professor Raphael de Villar. And today we will talk about uh, the use of laser acetine bio bioprinting for the application in vivo for bone regeneration. First of, uh, first of all, um, a few words about the Biotis unit based in Bordeaux. Uh, we have three main axes of research. The first one is the vascular tissue engineering. The second one is bone tissue engineering. 
and we have also a biofabrication unit uh, to answer and to modelize uh, pathological models. <clears throat> to give you a short clinical context, every year it was estimated that 3% of the worldwide population is affected by a bone trauma or bone resection, so it affects about 250 million people, and 10% of this trauma will be critical. That means that the bone wound won't be able to be healing by itself. So it will result as an outcome for the patient in medical complications, and it may even lead to death. So currently, there are two main strategies in order to come from a critical defect that cannot heal by itself in order to get a repairned bone and a fully efficient new formed bone. First, we can use graft. When it's possible, we take some bone tissue from the very patient and place it in the defect area. When it's not possible, we can uh, access to uh, a donor uh, bone tissue, and it's the allograft, or we can even use uh, animal tissue. This is the xenograft. So using graft has a strong advantage because it perfectly mimics the physiology of the native tissue. But uh, as main uh, disadvantage, so grafts are often associated with inflammation events, with contamination maybe, and it may lead to reject. So graft is the gold standard therapy, but maybe not the best possible. For many decades now, synthetic substitutes uh, has emerged, and now we have many strategies possible in order to uh, to, to heal many types and kind of bone uh, wounds or defects. So we have many strategies, many possibilities with the certification of a product that was uh, controlled for uh, sterility, for biocompatibility, that was approved and manufactured. But usually the substitutes are not really um, fitting with the bone natural physiology. And long-term sustainability may be a problem for them. So ideally, the best, uh, the ideal treatment would be a manufactured autograft. We would take cells from the patient for the patient, so we would not have any biocompatibility problem with a very satisfying reproduction of the native tissue physiology and with all the um, the characteristic of a manufactured product, such as reproducibility and uh, sterility. And this, all of these concepts are gathered into tissue engineering. So tissue engineering, uh, I will spare you the, the whole definition, but can find its application in regenerative medicine through the use of biocom biocompatible uh, materials. So basically we will take cells from the, the patient, we will manipulate them ex vivo, and we will associate them with specific scaffolds, specific structures with living or non-living elements in order to poten potentialize uh, their effects and place them back then into the body in order to recover, restore uh, an organ or tissue function. And this may be applied in uh, regenerative medicine, thanks to biofabrication, and among bio biofabrication techniques, we can find bioprinting. Bioprinting was, uh, has emerged in the early 2000s and was defined as the use of a computer in order to uh, spatially organize competent cells. So bioprinting is basically bio-ink associated to a bioprinter and are printed over a bio-paper. So the bio ink is usually cells or competent elements in order to have an effect on the site where they are supposed to be printed. So the bio paper and the bio printer is the device that will uh, print the bio ink. So bio printing requires three main um, axes. The first one is to really define the needs in order to assess, uh, to, to suit to your model. Then you have to select the adequate technology. We'll see just after that there are different strategies of bioprinting. And then you have to make sure that uh, your bioprinting process is reproducible and standardized. So just to tell you about what are the most known bioprinting techniques, you have the extrusion and the injets that are one of the most studied techniques for bioprinting. And today we'll discuss about laser assisted bioprinting. The main difference between those techniques 
are the resolution scales. Because with extrusion and inkjet, you may achieve a resolution up to hundreds or 100 micrometers. And only with the laser assisted by printing, you may achieve a resolution up to 10 micrometers. In our lab, we are able to print uh, droplets that are 50 micrometers si um, length. So you, the laser assisted bioprinting derived from the lift, which is laser induced forward transfer, which had uh, many applications in the metallurgic industry. So basically, the the, the laser beam was um, had an impact on a donor slide covered with metal, and then the metal was projected onto uh, upon a, a receipt slide. And as you can see, if you um, if you increase the energy of the laser, then you have the more uh, metal that is transferred. In bioprinting, it is the same um, the same principle. A laser beam will be deflected and then will um, hit a gold layer. So this is our um, donor slide, which contains the bio ink. The bio ink is composed of uh, either cells or living or non-living elements that we want to print and that will be transferred onto a receipt slide, so a substrate that can be hydrogel, that can be living tissue. And the fact that we are using a laser pulse will help, will um, give us the opportunity to print droplet per droplet the bio ink. And we can, through this, print specific patterns with a very high resolution. So laser assisted by printing is actually uh, depending on many, many parameters. So affecting one of these parameters will affect the outcome of your printing. So when you are using the laser assisted by printing, you have to make sure that everything is under control. Otherwise, you will have uh, an unexpected result. So we are looking to get this kind of uh, droplet ejection. If you are uh, using a laser without enough energy or with a bio ink that, that will be too thick, that will be too viscous, then it won't be possible to generate an, um, a droplet. Or in the opposite, if you are using too much energy, if you are using um, a bio ink that is uh, too thin or too liquid, then you will have a very messy printing. So the, one of the greatest challenge uh, in bone tissue engineering is to get an appropriate host response. So you come from a critical defect, so the wound cannot heal by itself, and then you will apply tissue engineering strategy. And the objective is to first have an effective implantation of what you are printing, and then to get uh, in the final outcome a physiological and a, a restoration of the mechanical functions of the tissue. One of the greatest barrier that challenges the bioprinters is to get a vascularized system because at the site of the defect, if you do not have the opportunity to bring out oxygen, if you can't bring nutrients, or if you can evacuate the waste products, the uh, inflammatory cytokines, etc., then you will have uh, a loss of survival, your tissue will necrose, and then the printed elements will die. So the defect will remain the same. So having a vascularized, a vascularized system is very important in bioprinting. So the main question was, how can we integrate using laser-assisted bioprinting a microvascular network in vivo to promote the bone regeneration? First of all, oh, first of all, <laughs> We determine the best in vitro parameters using a correct cell type. We'll get to that. Then add, when we had the, the pattern that we wanted, we prepared the in vivo experience by selecting different patterns for bioprinting. And then we transferred this technology to in vivo. So first, uh, Jean-Michel Bourget and his collaborators uh, assessed the wanted to create a pattern that would remain through time by using the laser assisted bioprinting in order to generate a microvascular system. So we basically used UVEC, which are human umbilical vein undotable cells that were fluorescent. This is the, um, the red dots that you can see on the right side of the slide. 
they were pretty different uh, patterns. The patterns were only lines in order to generate afterwards um, a pre-vessel. And first, we identified the first problem that if we were printing the lines too close to each other, then 24 hours later, the cells were spreading everywhere and we were losing our pattern. So this problem was overcome by using a larger uh, gap between the lines. And as you can see here, 24 hours later, the cells kind of remained in place. But this wasn't really um, enough. And a new strategy was to associate the endothelial cells to mesenchymal stromal cells. Because stromal cells and endothelial cells can communicate and can create bonds with each other. And it appeared that using a co-culture of uh, mesenchymal cells and endothelial cells um, preserved the pattern within time. So 24 hours in the monoculture, as you can see, the pattern was kind of destroyed because the cells were going anywhere. But using the, the mesenchymal cells, the pattern was remaining in place. So the second step was to get a microvascular network. So Olivia Keoredan uh, achieved this work by using a laser sitting by printing. The strategy was first to recreate what we did using the biopaper loaded with uh, mesenchymal cells in order to maintain the pattern through time. And as uh, previously seen, we printed over it uh, endothelial cells. So first, we wanted to uh, achieve the highest concentration of cells because we wanted to get closer to uh, the physiology of the tissue for clinical applications. And we noticed that the highest possible concentration of cells that we may use was 70 million cells per milliliter, resulting in, after the printing, a density of 2,000 cells per milli uh, square millimeters. And as we increased the concentration of cells, we had also to increase the laser energy in order to maintain uh, the best printing parameters. After six days of culture, it appeared that using 70 million of cells um, per milliliter as a concentration was actually the best concentration in order to get a, uh, a well-connected network that was still remaining after the culture. L uh, lesser, a lesser cell density was leading to actually an unstable network and even lower than 1,500, actually no network was, uh, was created. So as you know, within the natural tissue, um, vessels are never alone. They're always trapped within matrix with uh, different cytokines, with exchanges with different cells. And we wanted to reproduce this by uh, placing an overlay over our printing pattern. And we used two strategies. First, we just applied collagen alone. And we also used collagen and scabs and VEGF, which is a cytokine that promotes angiogenesis. As a result, we saw that using the overlay containing the mesenchymal cells and the VEGF was resulting in a better preservation of the prison pattern and even through time to the creation of the microvascular network. This is a time lapse that gets from uh, hour zero post printing up to 45 hours post printing. And you can see that the cells start to organize, they start to uh, make bounds to each other. instead of uh, going elsewhere, thanks to the presence of the scaps. And actually, six days post printing, we found that uh, the endothelial cells were creating vascular network. So then we wanted to uh, adapt these results to our future in vivo experiments. So our model was the bone calvaria defect in mice. So we were practicing, we, we aimed to practice two defects in, calva in mice calvaria. The first one without the impression and the second, the experimental defect. We had three, three strategies of patterns 
The first one was a disk. The second one, a central disk of endothelial cells. The second strategy was a ring, or two rings actually, uh, at the periphery of the defect. And the last strategy was a combination of the two previous with two rings and uh, a bar of cells. So now let's get to the in vivo application. Olivia Kerouet don't perform this, uh, this experiment. And as, as I just told you, the, the mouse model was applied. Um, just an aparte to say that obviously all of these experiments were under the uh, ethical approbation uh, of the French uh, Ministry of Research and Agriculture. So we practice an incision uh, over the skull of the mice, and then we were able to access to the calvaria, and we removed a 3.3 millimeter disc of bone, which corresponds to the critical size of a defect. And then we were able to remove the machine bone. Then we transferred the animals to the printing device, and we were able, thanks to a camera within the device, to very precisely locate the defect and then um, center our printing pattern. So first, we prepared our bioing right here on the left. We applied the cells upon our donor slide coated with gold. And when the cells were coated on the slide, we transferred it into the device in order to get the printing done. The printing by itself is a very short uh, process, actually. It takes 10 seconds to be completed. And within those 10 seconds, the laser impact uh, lands for even less than one second. So it happens very fast. And then we had to check the, um, the preservation of our patterns uh, through microscopic observation. And as you can see, the ring, the disc, and the cross circle were uh, nicely printed. And we have, as a control, a random seeding made by hand. Two months later, uh, we observed that microvascular structures uh, were created for our control condition, which was a random seeding. We observed that, unfortunately, the microvascular structure observed were slightly outside of the critical uh, defect area. But for the, the printed patterns, actually, we observed that, and especially for the ring and the cross circle, we observed that a strong vasculature system was in place within the area of the defect. Oh, no. So we performed several analyses, and as a result, our model of the collagen associated with VGF, SCAPS, and UVEC that were printed was significantly superior and uh, br brought a higher cell dens vessel density than uh, using only collagen or no implanted material. So using only collagen is not efficient to recreate a vessel uh, system. And concerning our patterns, actually, the cross circle was found to be the, the most performant pattern in order to generate a vascularization. Then we assessed the bone regeneration. So those are micro CT images. As you can see in red, it's the control defect without bioprinting. And on the right, on the green, it's the, the, the area you put in where we print the cells and the scaffold. And we can observe that the random seeding was not very efficient in order to generate bone repair. But for the other um, patterns used, we had uh, a nice reduction of the bone defect size. We performed histological uh, assays, and we determined that the bone volume formation was higher in our condition when, where we were printing the collagen with the VGF, with the scaps, and the UVEX. And as well, we confirmed that the cross circle was responsible for the highest bone regeneration rate. So we, we were able to apply all of these patterns designed uh, in vitro to our model. And we saw that the host response was depending strictly on the pattern that we chose. 
So the laser assisted by printing was really efficient in order to uh, spatially organize our cells. Then we were able to discriminate the optimal cell density to generate our microvascular network. And then we demonstrated that the host response was really depending on the pattern that we printed over the defect. Uh, to conclude, I would just like to thank all our collaborators and our financial support. Thank you very much, and I will take your questions. Okay, so Bruno is asking, does the source material has to be gold? Actually, different metals can be used. It appears that after a few trials, that gold has the best properties in order to conduct the laser energy. So gold is the best metal used in our lab, at least for our um, techniques, in order to uh, have the best reproducibility in our printing system. How about the compatibility between gold and the cells? Well, as you may imagine, a, a slight part of gold is transferred to the, to the substrate, to, so the, to the received slide. And actually, the, the quantity of gold that is transferred is very, very low. And it happens that it does not have any kind of effect on uh, cell viability or cell differentiation potential. So it doesn't affect the, the cell metabolism. How much time do you have between sealing the cells on gold and active laser on? Well, this, those two events are very close. We have to prepare the, the cell bioink. So it, it takes 15 minutes to prepare the cell bioink. Then we spread the cell upon the gold um, donor slide. And then the transfer is like five seconds to get in the machine and then to have the printing uh, carried on. So it, it's, it happens really fast. SCAPs, UVEX are all human cells. Don't you think you could have get an even better answer in vivo using cells from the same species? Well. Yes, it could have been used to uh, take some um, mice cells. However, we, we aim to uh, transfer this, um, this procedure to, uh, to human uh, application. And it appears that we are using uh, mouse that are immunodepressed. So there is no problem, no compatibility, no problem of compatibility between the mice and the human cells. And using the human cells, we can discriminate them from the mice cells, and we can determine if the cells that remains in the site of uh, defect are the cells that we printed, and the response that we obtain can be determined by the presence of those cells. Can you transfer cells to 3D scaffolds? Well, absolutely. It depends on the scaffold, obviously. But uh, according to the laser energy that you will use, you may uh, print uh, the cells through a certain uh, thickness of your scaffold. So it doesn't have to be on a single layer, but it's usually on the same level. And then you have to place another, um, another stratification of your, of your scaffold. Do you know if the microvascularization generated was functional? Did you try a long time enough for that? Um, well, I'm not sure to understand the question. The, did you try a long time enough for that? Well, we, we characterized the, the microvascular network by um, specifically aiming for endothelial cells and um, and vessel um, molecules. And it appeared that 
endothelial cells uh, characteristics were found within the microvascular system, but we couldn't manage to see uh, this microvascular system um, in activity, actually. And I, I'm not sure to understanding the question. Did you try a long time enough for that? The fact that the, the, the tissue uh, taken from the, the defect site was not necrosed is an indicator of that the microvascular system was efficient. Also, do you know the microvascular? Okay. <laughs> Well, if there is no more questions, thank you. Uh, I will... Thank you, uh, Nicola, and thank you, Serge, for uh, your participation uh, in this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, thank you, thank you all for uh, watching. Uh, so, this uh, webinar will be uh, uploaded to uh, our uh, YouTube account, so you can uh, check it on the Atlantic Catmed uh, account. Uh, also, uh, if you want to know more about uh, our European project, we have uh, a website and a LinkedIn account, so you can you can uh, always uh, go there to to find out uh, about our activities. Um, so this is a conclusion. Thank you, thank you all uh, for today. And uh, see you, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.